Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, the show that is part of the Simply Luxurious Life online destination, cultivating the art of living well, a life of quality over quantity. Visit the blog, The Simply Luxurious Life at our simplified URL, tsll.co or the simply luxurious life.com. There you'll find the show notes for each podcast episode, as well as much more weekly content to elevate your everyday and deepen your contentment from a Monday motivational post recipes, videos of the cooking show series, style and decor inspiration, French and British inspired content and readers favorite regular weekly post this and that, which is posted each Friday morning. Now to today's episode. Welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. Welcome to the 312th episode of The Simple Sophisticate. Today, I'm going to be speaking with a return guest to the podcast, Tracy Hooper, who has written a book that is pertinent to our times. But as I explain, and I think you will find as you listen to today's conversation, is an evergreen resource that we can use to elevate the quality of our connections at work in our everydays, in our personal lives, and just in our communities at large. Her book is called The New Hello, What to Say, What to Do in the New World of Work. And Tracy will talk about the philosophy of what she does, the confidence project, what is the fundamental component and importance of strengthening our own confidence. How does that benefit, obviously, us? but others and our connection with those individuals as well. She's going to give a lot of tangible tools throughout the conversation, modeling a lot of what we talk about so you can really get your mind around the reason we should apply these skills and how to cultivate them in our lives. She will also talk about shifting from the default of saying sorry to thank you why we should consider doing it, and how to do it simply. Lastly, what is our personal currency? She's going to explain what that is and why it makes a tremendous difference in all aspects of our lives to increase our personal currency, not just for us again, but for those we connect with. We'll talk about many other things, but I think you'll find today's conversation abundant with tools, to yes, definitely apply in your workspace, how to connect via the video phone calls, how to transition back and forth between video phone calls and in person, how to navigate all the different changes that are happening in the workplace right now, as well as just tips and tricks for living a better life and strengthening our connections with other people. So let's get to it. Here is my conversation with Tracy Hooper. Returning to the show today and joining me from Portland, Oregon, is the founder of The Confidence Project, who has just released a new book, The New Hello, What to Say, What to Do in the New World of Work. Tracy Hooper, welcome back to the show. (laughs) Thank you, Shannon. I'm thrilled to be here. We met each other many years ago, and I'm delighted to be back. Thank you. Well, I was just, I went back through my archives, just so readers and listeners know, you were in the first season of this show. We're now in season eight. You are in uh, the beginning of season eight with me today, but you were on episode five and you talked all about what your confidence project is. So I will direct listeners if they're more curious uh, to learn about that when they listen to episode five. But today I want to talk about your new book, The New Hello. Um, Mm -hmm. It was inspired largely, if not mainly by the shifts that happened in the workplace prompted by the pandemic. 
And you yeah. share in your introduction that your book, The New Hello, quote, is a chapter in learning the habits and practice of confidence at a time when we need more than ever connection, collaboration, and civility. So from the workplace perspective, how does confidence play a role in each of these three concepts, connection, collaboration, and civility? Mm. Well, first of all, confidence is a skill that has to be learned. Uh, some people believe they're, other people are born with confidence. They have a natural uh, confident personality. They're type A. They're outgoing. And there is a part of confidence that's in our genes, but the rest of it comes from taking action. And that's been the big aha for me in building this business is that confidence can be learned. And the way that we learn confidence is by practicing skills one by one, the way you would learn how to play chess or the guitar or tennis, any skill. I mean, we just saw that with the Olympics, how long these professional athletes trained over and over again. And that's what we can do with the confidence skills. And that's exciting because you can take that into your personal life and your professional life as well. And that has to do with, you know, connection. How do you connect with people? Well, it's treating people as if they're the most important person in the room. That's the philosophy of the confidence project. And if you do that, then you begin to get a good connection with people. They feel important. And then it becomes this virtuous cycle. You feel more confident because people are responding to you. People respond to you because you feel more confident. It's exciting. And I think that's maybe what will bring some ease or peace of mind to this is it's something each of us, when we choose to, can learn. And we just have to make it a priority um, because it doesn't just happen because we want it to happen. Right. That's right. That's <laughs> and, right. And that's what your confidence project does. You are the teacher. You are there to let them exercise those skills. I love this portion of your book because you talk about how the world of work requires, quote, flexibility, respect, patience, and empathy for yourself and others. And then you go on to say it requires ease and movement from in-person to digital interaction. So going back and forth, not knowing when those interactions are going to have to shift back and forth, all the while remaining confident in the role you are expected to fill at work. So this, this leads me to my question. I want mm -hmm. to talk about how you include being respectful, patient, empathetic, and flexible with ourselves. I love that. Oh, my. What does that look like? How can we be that way for ourselves and to ourselves? That is a daily practice. I, I believe if we treat ourselves well, if we feel that we deserve to be kind to ourselves, the way we would treat other people, then it's easier to treat other people well. For instance, and we've all been in this situation you say, ah, oh, you should have done that better. What's your problem? What were you thinking about? You should have been quicker. You should have come back and said something else. And then we immediately put ourselves in a negative position, which then pulls everyone down in the room. If we're having this conversation in our head, which I call the mean girl, the mean girl in our head, if we have that conversation in our head, then it spills out into the universe, so to speak. So the idea of being kind to yourself, let's, let's take a video call, for instance. We all have to be able to Zoom or use whatever platform we do with confidence. How do you do that? You look into the camera, you lift your laptop so it's eye level. And by what I mean by looking at the camera, look into that lens. It's so easy to look at the screen, which I know it's our inclination because we get feedback. I'm seeing you smile right now. You're nodding your head. And I love that. We all need that, that kind of nonverbal feedback. But the real trick to being confident on video calls is to look at, I call it spot the dot, look into that camera, which is lens, which is right next to the dot on your camera, whether it's embedded in your computer or whether it's an external camera. And when you do that, it makes people feel as if you're looking directly at them. And when you look directly at them, then they feel important. And then everyone is elevated in the conversation, in the meeting, whatever's happening. That's how you can begin to be kind to yourself. Learn these skills, camera confidence skills, and then you feel confident enough to approach people and then they feel acknowledged as well. And literally you are letting them feel as though they are seen literally and figuratively because it feels that they are seeing you, even though, as we know, you're looking at the dot, you're not looking at them, which is just so weird. Yes, I know. Well, here's a trick for you. Um, 
you can glance down at your screen. For instance, I'm glancing down at you occasionally. And when, and when you're talking, I'm looking at you. I can look at the screen while you're talking because you're not really noticing that I'm not looking at you. But then when it's my turn to talk to you, then I look back up at the screen. I, I have learned to use my peripheral vision, not just left and right, not on either side, but down below too. So I've now trained myself two years into this, because we're doing it all day, every day, to glance down at the screen and and look at people. And that's how you can get some kind of nonverbal cue that people are getting it. No, I appreciate that. And you're right. Didn't think about that peripheral vision. Yes, we always think side to side, but top bottom now, top bottom. Yeah. And that's that's mm-hmm. great advice. I know many people are probably very appreciative for that. I know I am. Uh, <laughs> Good. You, you, in your book, you take us back into the history of the handshake because, you know, we all had to shift all of a sudden. The French, you know, had to, you know, step back from their base. Who's, although I did, someone recently told me that that has resumed in their small community and they were so grateful for it. Um, oh. They're vaccinated. They're, but even so, I know that's a choice that individuals individuals can make, but things yeah. shifted. So I, you talk through the history though, of why the handshake is so powerful, why it was something people engaged in. Can you walk us through that and why, yeah, yeah what, what the importance of it was? Well, it, it comes from way back in the history of man and woman, when people would show that they weren't holding any spears or weapons to hurt you. And they would extend their hand to let you know it's safe to be here with me. Fast forward where we are in the 20th and 21st century, people shake hands as a way to to really show how professional they are. And I, I have a story in the book about a man I met who at a business luncheon three years ago, who was an, is an architect and builds bridges in Portland, which is a big deal. It's known as Bridge City with 12 bridges that span uh, the Willamette River in our city. And I said to him, oh, it's very nice to meet you. And he said, oh, me too. And we shook hands and he said, wow, you really have a firm handshake for a woman. And I said, thank you very much. You really have a firm handshake for a man. (laughs) And we both laughed. He realized the absurdity of that comment. Of course, I have a firm handshake. So I think especially for women, having a firm handshake lets people know that you are professional that you have a sense of yourself. Now we don't do that anymore. And the handshake, I don't know whether it's on hiatus or whether it's gone for good. I was with some friends last week. I was visiting my family back East and I met my great high school friends outdoors uh, at a, for dinner. And one of my friends is a realtor. And she said to me, Tracy, people still want to shake my hand when I'm showing them houses. They just do. They feel more confident in me that I'm a professional. What can I do? And I said, well, one of the things you can do is put your hand over your heart and say, I'd love to shake your hand, but I'm not ready yet. Great to meet you. Let's go in the house. In other words, don't dwell. Don't say, I'm sorry, I'm not shaking hands. I'm not really ready. I know it's weird. I should do it. No, you don't need to apologize. Simply put your hand over your heart. That gives you something to do with your right hand. If you put it there, then you're not awkward about. And if somebody comes at you, you know, wanting to give a hug, you know, you can certainly put both hands over your heart and say, I would love to hug you. It's so great to see you again, but I'm not ready. Tell me what's going on in your world. And then you deflect, you go right into what they might want to talk about. And that's one thing I want readers or listeners to know about your book is you share so many examples, pro tips on this is what the situation may be that you're not comfortable with for a safety protocol or whatever that maybe someone is disregarding or doesn't know about. And you give Examples so that both people can remain comfortable, but both people can feel that they do get to do what they need to do to feel safe or feel respected or to maintain that uh, professional position. And I actually want to jump ahead to one of the questions I wrote because you mentioned it about saying sorry. Mm. Um, You write that in most cases, a simple shift of language from I'm sorry to thank you makes all the difference. And it's this idea that, and you went through a lot of these examples in the book, and I really appreciate this because sorry seems to be a bit of an epidemic. We're not using it for the reason that I think largely it most helpfully can be used for. And it doesn't help build our credibility nor strengthen the relationship in an equal fashion. Can you explain what you mean by shifting from I'm sorry to thank you? Now, look, if you step on someone's toe, if you hurt someone's feelings, if you made a mistake, 
by all means, apologize. Make it count. There's nothing better than an authentic apology. I'm sorry I missed the deadline. I know that messed up your project calendar. I can get you the information by Friday. How does that work for you? Four sentences. That's it. Don't need to over-apologize. But think about think about in our everyday conversation, some two people are headed for the same door. Somebody says, oh, sorry. Or you could say, after you. Heading into a COVID-safe elevator. Oh, sorry about that. You know, you go ahead. Or you could say, I have a meeting in five minutes. Would you mind if I went ahead of you, please? Now, the thank you piece is really great because how often have we said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not wearing a mask. Oh, sorry, I, uh, I, we, were, we require masks here at the office. Um, sorry, we're standing too close. All These are new I'm sorry's just since the pandemic happened. If you say, thanks for reminding me to wear a mask. Thanks for joining us. We require masks here. Um, thanks for keeping our distance. I want us both to be safe. When you can say thank you, it has so much of a bigger impact. When we apologize too much, it chips away at our confidence. It sends a message that we're making all kinds of mistakes when we're not. And it's exhausting. When you switch it to thank you, it makes you feel more empowered. And people love it. You know, how many times have we been on a Zoom call and the dog barks or the doorbell rings? Oh, sorry about the noise. Sorry, my neighbor's putting on a new roof. You could say, thank you for your patience. Thank you for welcoming my cat. You know, please, uh, you're, you're muted. Thanks for unmuting yourself. Instead of, oh, sorry to tell you this, you're muted. Could you undo that? And even the bot, you and I are seeing each other, but our, your listeners are listening. But the body language changes when we say, I'm sorry too much. We sort of curl forward and say, sorry. People ask me all the time, is it more feminine? Is it more masculine? I think there is a tendency for women to apologize more. But in my world, I hear plenty of men apologizing too. And you're right, it's an epidemic. And making that switch to thank you is empowering. Yeah, it doesn't take anything away from the person that you're communicating with. It just holds the space for both people. And I think it just shows awareness. Also, what you're saying, because I think sometimes it's just honestly a default. I think we don't realize how we just slip into it because it's all all we've we've done it for so long. Um, yes. Uh, well, I love the, the different um, language examples. As an English or language teacher myself, <laughs> words matter. And this is all about communication. And you give ex- examples again and again and again. And one of them is words to lose versus words to use. There's an entire section on this. Um, Can we talk about a couple of these? Yes. (laughs) First, what to avoid and then how to correct it. And that's what I also appreciate about your book. You say this may be what you have said or what people have said, but this is how you would shift it to keep the same meaning. Let's begin with correct me if I'm wrong, which is a a, a phrase to lose. Just be clear. (laughs) Don't don't use it. Um, What is... What is something that is not so helpful about saying that, number one, and then what's the shift? Yeah. Well, let's start off with the category. The, this is one of those disclaimers. And a disclaimer is a, a, a phrase that you use so that you sound modest or humble, but it dampens our voice instead. So when we say, correct me if I'm wrong, that's as if you're asking someone to correct you even before you opened your mouth. Instead, you could say, let me know if I heard this correctly. Same point, stronger. Let me know if I heard this correctly. Another disclaimer is, oh, you know, I, I know you've been doing this a lot longer. Well, that may be true, but you could be bringing a fresh perspective. So instead you could say, in my experience or from my perspective. It's really cool. And here's one of the big takeaways from the book, Shannon. I hope I'll say it again and again. These skills you learn over time. And particularly with the words to lose and the words to use, pick one phrase every 30 days that you want to get rid of and what you want to replace it with. If you tried to lose every phrase or word in chapter six, you'd go crazy. So this is a way to be kind to yourself. Remember, we talked about that at the beginning. This is a way to be kind to yourself. Pick a word or phrase, practice it. And the best way you know whether you have these words to lose is to record yourself. Yeah, it's painful <laughs> and it's enlightening, but it's painful. I, I, I learned this lesson. I uh, was getting ready to be on a talk show and you've been on the same one in Portland, Afternoon Live. 
And uh, I was preparing about a week ahead of time. I talked with the producer about the theme and the questions. I had sent the team, the questions to the host and the producer. And about a week ahead of time, I was practicing my answers. Of course, I believe practice makes progress. Remember that. It's not practice makes perfect. Practice makes progress. And if you think of it that way, then you, then you are kinder to yourself. Anyway, I put my cell phone on the shelf. I call it a shelfie. I press record. And in the course of a six-minute mock interview, between my cell and me, I use the word so 13 times. 13, it's once every 30 seconds. I learned from that experience that a recording doesn't lie. If you, if you want to practice some of these words to lose and figure out what phrases you can replace them with, ask a friend or a coworker if you can record a conversation. Say, I'd like to improve my language, my communication. Can we record our conversation? And they will think it's weird, and they may hesitate, and the first minute or two will be awkward. But then after that, you'll get into a conversation, and then you'll be able to hear those words to lose. It's, it's so true. You know, one of the exercises I had my students in my language class um, do was I would count their likes. And I find oh. their awareness was brought to it. And then it started to shift. I remember when I first had to teach myself to get rid of the word like when it's not used in the comparison form. Mm-hmm. And I was amazed how, again, a default that is used to fill that is not helpful in communicating my message. And it's just that awareness. You're not trying to say you're doing something wrong. You're just saying, do you want to communicate clearly and effectively? This is a way to do it. And it's a simple thing, but again, it's a skill and you do have to keep practicing it. So one, Very skill, much so. one skill a month or one, one phrase or, or word a month, we can do that. We can do that. And I'll tell you about the word like professional interviewers tell us that the top three distractions are number one, people who play with their hair. We do that. We get nervous. We fool with our hair. We primp, we preen. And it's not just women. (laughs) Men have these pandemic beards. They're playing with their beards all the time. And anyway, that's the number one distraction. Number two is adjusting our glasses. That's one of those unconscious habits. When we are anxious, we tend to fool with our glasses. And the number three distraction, according to professional interviewers, is using the word like. The way to lose that word, once you know what your word is, practice the power of pause. You know, before a comedian ever delivers a punchline, they pause. We can do the same thing. Don't have to fill up every second of a conversation with a sound. If you know you're tempted to say like or the word pretty, how often have we said, I'm a pretty good speaker. I'm, I'm pretty prepared for this. I'm, uh, I'm pretty successful. Whoa. Talk about, that's called a hedge. That's where you, you want to, you want to soften. You don't want to seem too aggressive. So you hedge. When you use a word like pretty, it does dampen your voice. Practice the power of pause and say, I'm prepared for this interview. I'm, I'm experiencing a lot of success. Pause long enough to take that word out. And if you can reduce it by, I don't know. Five words, five times a week. If you if you typically say like forty times a day, which people who do do, and I do too, I still have my weak words, and I'm working on them all the time. But if you can reduce it, that's the goal. And it's really about using language that's worthy of you, where people feel excited to talk with you. There is much more to come in our conversation. We'll talk about personal currency. We'll talk about how we can network in our times. The power of using our hands if we are taking a lot of calls on video, Zoom, or whatever platform you might be using. And Tracy will also share a petit plaisir to wrap up today's episode. But before we get to the latter half, I want to take a four-minute break and introduce you to some sponsors for today's episode. I'll be right back. As prices rise on some of the fundamentals we need in our everyday lives, from clothes, groceries, gas, you name it, there are now more options than ever to help you cut your personal costs where you can. And that includes with your auto insurance. While shopping for auto insurance may not be all that much fun, Gabby is there to do the work for you. 
Things that could take days or weeks will just take minutes with Gabby. Gabby uses your current policy to compare your current coverage with 40 of the top insurance providers, such as Progressive, Nationwide, and Travelers. They're the one true comparison platform with fast, verifiable quotes, not ballpark guesses. And because Gabby uses your current coverage, they only show policies that are the same or better than what you already have, many of them at a lower price. And Gabby is free to use, and they never sell your information. I took some time to get on their website and discovered that, yes, indeed, it was absolutely user-friendly, simple to input my information, and I received various quotes at equal or lesser value than what I currently had for the same coverage. People who switch with Gabby save on average $80 a month versus their current policy. As a simple, sophisticated listener, you have the opportunity to start saving today. Gabby has been featured in TechCrunch, Forbes, and USA Today. Start saving on your auto insurance by going to gabby.com slash sophisticate. That's gabby, G-A-B-I dot com slash sophisticate. It's totally free and you can start saving today. The Simple Sophisticate is also sponsored by BetterHelp. Is there something interfering with your happiness? Is there something preventing you from achieving your goals? BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist, connect in a safe and private online environment that's also convenient. This is not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online, and you can start communicating in under 48 hours. With licensed professional counselors who are specialized in depression, stress, LGBTQ matters, family conflicts, self-esteem, trauma, sleep, you're sure to find what you need. Everything you share is confidential, and it's time for you to start living a happier life today. As a listener of the Simple Sophisticate podcast, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting the sponsor of our show today, betterhelp.com slash simple. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash simple. The Simple Sophisticate is also sponsored by Woodstock Chimes. Did you know that Woodstock chimes were the first wind chimes tuned to specific notes, changing the industry forever from looks pretty and makes noise to looks pretty and sounds amazing. Founder and owner Gary Kivstad is a Grammy award winning professional musician and has created a company known for finely tuning musical instruments played by the wind. These chimes have been called musical works of art and are the world's favorite wind chime. Over 40 years in business, they have sold their chimes in all 50 states and around the world. Woodstock Chimes offers chimes tuned to various melodies and music scales, and each one is different and delightful. They also have decorative chimes, wind bells, gongs, fountains, and sun catchers to help you create tranquil spaces in your home or garden, and a line of personalized hit chimes that are laser engraved with your own message prior to shipping. All of them make great gifts. You can listen to sound samples on the website and you'll even find wonderfully large, deep tone chimes that really make a statement in your entryway or gazebo. As a simple, sophisticated listener, you have the opportunity to get 15% off by going to chimes.com and using the promo code SIMPLE. Go to chimes.com, the world's favorite wind chime, and use the code SIMPLE to get 15% off. Whether you're back in the office or still in your loungewear working from home, life's day-to-day responsibilities may be lacking or feeling they're lacking something, such as travel. Fun Jet Vacations is a one-stop shop for all your vacation needs. And as experts in the industry, Fun Jet Vacations offers customers a fast, easy, and fun way to book their next vacation with exclusive package deals to all-inclusive resorts in Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean. For a limited time, listeners of the Simple Sophisticate podcast can use promo code FUNJET75 for $75 off your next FUNJET vacation at Ryu Hotels and Resorts. Whether you're looking for a family-friendly resort or an adults-only getaway, there's a Ryu Hotel and Resort for you. To get started, just go to funjet.com or contact your travel advisor and you'll be out of the office in no time. Offer is only valid at funjet.com when booked by October 15th for travel through December 2021. Restrictions apply. And I'm listening to you here talking about words, literal words that we're going to communicate with. But we also, as you are demonstrating very effectively, as I'm watching you, 
do we use our hands? Mm. What is it? I just because you actually already answered uh, the previous question. Thank you for sharing the three main distractors. So I want to move into this conversation about use of hands, a powerful and potentially effective tool for communicating. Why are our hands a tool not to dismiss and how can we use them effectively? Mm. Well, it's never been more important than ever to use them on video calls because people are only seeing us from the shoulders up. And from my research, I found a really great article by Dr. Andrew Franklin, who's at a university in Virginia. And he says that when we can only see people, a short, small part of someone's body, and we don't get that three-dimensional version of a person, it's very hard on our brain. It makes our brain have to work overtime. So we're looking for all these clues that people are with us, that they're connecting to us. We don't often see people, especially if you have 20 people on a call and everybody's in a tiny little box, you can't see whether somebody is even nodding their head. They're too far, they're too tiny. But when someone uses their hands, it gives us a chance to reinforce the words that we're using. In other words, if I'm talking about a point I want to make, I can hold up my index finger and say, I'd like to make a point here. I have one point to make. Or we are an inclusive culture. You can take your arms and around a ball, for instance, an invisible ball. We are an inclusive culture. Or we want to elevate everyone's ability to do well on conference calls by lifting both of your hands up and your palms open. These are ways that people connect with us. Now, we don't want to overuse your hands. I was working with a client a couple of weeks ago. He's a great guy and he's doing a lot of work. He's um, mid-career. I would say he's in his late 50s and he'd like to have a job at another company. So he's beginning to interview and he hired me to help him prepare for these interviews. So we talked about using his hands. Well, within 10 minutes, he looked like an, an airplane that was off course. It was so funny. And of course, I know him well now. We've worked together several times. I said to him, okay, don't use your hands all the time. Be strategic when you use your hands. And we both had a big laugh about it. But whenever you can use your hands, that makes people feel more connected to you. That makes sense. That does make Mm -hmm. sense. I want to ask one quick question. You bring in a lot of different examples from people in different careers and a lot of different research. One of the examples of a career um, you bring in is an esthetician or anesthesiologist, sorry, an Mm. esthetician. We're not going to to get our facial. Um, (laughs) Anesthesiologist, and we're talking right now about the the, the requirement of wearing masks. Um, Most states are requiring them. I know here in Oregon for us, we are required indoor and out. Um, And I I appreciated his insight um, because he shares, and he's been an anesthesiologist in Portland for more than 30 years. Mm -hmm. How did he shed some light on how to communicate during work, even with a mask? Yeah. Well, this is great because because our faces are so covered, (laughs) our noses and our mouths, we don't get that we don't get that nonverbal cue from someone smiling. He says your eyes are a very important way for you to be able to communicate with people. And here's a great technique. When you lift your eyebrow, when you have active eyebrows, that lets people know that you might have a question or that you're interested in what they have to say and you'd like to learn more. So let your eyes be your friends. And when you're connecting with people, if it's, if it's uncomfortable for you to look someone in the eye, just look at the bridge of their nose. It's a great fake. Looks like you're looking them in the eye, but you are not you are not directly. Let your eyes work for you, raise your eyebrows, and then the other techniques that you can use is lean in. These are those nonverbal cues or they call them micro cues, where you lean in and you nod your head and you say something like, Hmm, that's interesting. Tell me more about that. Now people feel as if you want to know more, that you want to connect with them. And you're engaged and you're listening, which is what we want to know. Are they listening? Am I being heard? Yes. Am I being heard? And I always tell people in a conversation, you really only have to ask three questions ever. What, how, and tell me more. That's all you need, especially for someone who considers themselves to be introverted or quiet or reserved. How do I start a conversation? How do I keep it going? If you ask what, how, and tell me more, what's the most interesting part of your job? What have you found to be the most challenging part of working from home? 
How have you adjusted to working with your colleagues remotely? How do you find you can put barriers around the end of your day, those boundaries? Huh, tell me more about that. Keep going. When you say those small words, it makes a huge difference. And part of this comes from my background in a big family. You know, I grew up in a big family. There were six of us and at the dinner table. That was one of the gifts my mother provided is that we all had dinner together every night. And we all had to learn to listen and we all got a chance to talk. That was a very good skill. But then fast forward to my TV news career, the best reporters in the world are good listeners. And I'm finding that there are a lot of interviewers, reporters and anchors and so forth, who ask these really long-winded questions, don't give the, the, the person they're interviewing time to talk. So if you could say something like, huh, tell me more about that. That's interesting. Then it gives people permission to expand. No, I like that. And be heard. And it's very simple and easy to remember. So mm-hmm. when we keep practicing that skill. Thank you for practicing. sharing those examples too. You're welcome. And the examples um, kind of lead me into this next one. When we're trying to connect at work, networking, um, it's a little different because we're supposed to be staying, you know, six feet apart, uh, more masked, as you just said. You've given some great examples um, on how to communicate with our eyes. What are a couple of tips for networking well while respecting the safety protocols? Mm-hmm. Well, one of the ways that you can network well is to talk to people ahead of time about your preferences. When I come to this meeting, I'll be wearing a mask and I can't wait to see you again. In other words, you're almost preempting the awkward. No, you're not almost preempting the awkward. You are preempting the awkward. If you call someone ahead of time and say, I want you to know that I'm, I'm fully vaccinated and I would still like to wear a mask. Or if you don't want to talk about your vaccination status, you can say, regardless of whether either of us is vaccinated, I still would like to wear a mask and keep our distance. One of the keys, Shannon, this is a bit of a digression, is to use those I statements. When you use I statements, it gives you a chance to express your desires and your boundaries, and it doesn't make anyone feel defensive. If we say something like, You always come to these meetings without your mask on. Now that person is back on their heels feeling very defensive. But if you say, I would prefer that we both wear masks, even though we're six feet apart. Now you're talking about what your needs are. People can't argue with that. They may not be happy about it. But you are expressing your experience, your needs. I like yeah. that you shared that because it, it's I statements. And that's another key skill for communicating and building relationships in general. I feel statements. They can't take away your feelings. That is how you feel. So I think just transferring that into a workplace, that would be um, a simple shift for people if, if they've already been practicing the I feel statements. So thank you for bringing that. Yes. Up. I think that was helpful. Well, thank you. I was uh, talking with uh, a strategic partner of mine we've done some pre- presenting together yesterday and she is compl- she has not gone out at all and she's quite a successful financial advisor her business is growing she's doing well she's a master at networking online but she told me yesterday she'll say to someone uh in an email my preference is that we have a virtual meeting or a phone call what do you prefer and that way, people get to say they know her, they know that she wants it to be virtual, but she's giving them an option. Uh, I'll take a phone call. Terrific. See you then. I'll send you a calendar invite. I love that. But in terms of networking, you can still have a conversation with people, especially if it's in an open, if it's outside, for instance, or if it's in a big room. The most important skill I believe that you can use is to welcome someone into a conversation. You can still keep your distance. You use your your hand. You gesture for them to come into the conversation. And it could be something like, oh, Shannon, come join us. We were just talking about walking the dogs in the woods in the summer or whatever is the conversation. If you welcome someone into the conversation, then it makes everyone feel as if you are a leader. You are confident. You are comfortable in this in this situation. Now, if you can't remember someone's name, let's say I saw you. <laughs> oh, this, these tips are helpful. Go for it. <laughs> okay. 
All right. We haven't seen each other in a long time. I know I know you. I can't remember where I met you, but I see you in my peripheral vision, knowing you'd like to join a conversation. And so all I do is I say, oh, hi, come join us. Do you all know each other? And then other people will say, oh, I'm Jim Smith. I'm Lamar Jackson. I'm this person. And then that prompts the person who's being introduced to say their name. Do you all know each other? Oh, no. I'm Tracy Hooper. I'm Shannon Ables. It's great. It is the it is the perfect way to be in a situation. Or let's say that you remember, I remember your name, but I can't remember the names of other people in the group. We've just met each other. They don't have on name tags. We're six feet apart. So what you can say is I could say, oh, Shannon, come join us. We were just talking about our trip to Hawaii. You know what? I'll let you all introduce yourselves. And then people go around the group and say who they are. I'll let you. It's as if you're doing them a favor, but really you're saving yourself from having to muddle through trying to figure out who's who. I love that. Well, and you give a bunch of different examples in that regard of not knowing someone's name, but you know the person and you want to acknowledge and you want to engage. And one of them I thought was a great idea. It was about sharing what you remember about when you last met them, or for example, if I'm a teacher and I don't remember my former student's name, but I say, oh, that's right. It was a couple years ago in language arts and you did this particular project. You let them know that you remember them, but gosh darn it, you can't remember their name. And so it, it lets them know that you still do remember them. But you know what? I'm a human. Things slip yes. through. And I liked that one because I find that's my, mainly where I trip up is my name might slip, but I totally remember that student. I totally remember that person. It was a good memory. It was a good moment. I didn't, you know, so I, I appreciated those little helpful tricks and tips. Oh, I'm so glad. And you know, Shannon, give yourself some grace, girl. I imagine you had 170 students every year <laughs> for 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know, like, like you said at the beginning, I think of the conversation and is people want to know that you know them and that you say their name right and you know their name. It means so yeah. much. And I I, yes. I saw that in the classroom. I was aware of that. I mean, people sometimes call me Sharon. It's a completely honest mistake, but I'm not Sharon. And it, it's weird how I don't even know this person and it, it kind of hurts. I'm like, why does that hurt me? Yes. And then you're like, it's not personal, Shannon. Just let them know your name and move forward. So I get it. And so I feel bad when I can't. And so I don't think I'm alone in that. And so I appreciate those skills. Yes. And then, and then you simply say to them, help me with your name. Remind me of your name, please. Jim. Oh, Jim, of course. How are you? And again, move on. Don't dwell. Don't say, I'm, I'm great with faces, but I'm terrible with names. No need to apologize. There's so many opportunities for us not to apologize and to use words like, thank you for reminding me. Right. Great to see you again, Jim. How's it going for you in college? Or how's your new job? Thank you for modeling what we've been talking about this entire conversation, the, the oh. shift to thank you from sorry. That's helpful. Oh, you're you're um, most welcome. I just have a couple more questions, but I really do want to get these last two questions because as, as I went through the book, and, and readers, I know they can't see me hold this book up. You really can get through this in a good, healthy sitting. I mean, and, and you're going to want to go back through it. It's a great resource, but I I find it's it's a it's easy to get through when we're busy or, or you have other obligations at work. It's definitely a handbook to keep handy. But the conclusion reveals I don't want to say this. I, I think well, I'll just read this quote. You write, being confident doesn't mean that you're never afraid or intimidated. It means that you have practiced certain skills so that even in the midst of change, you know what to say or do next. This knowing lowers your anxiety and allows you to focus on your job and the relationships you want to build and nurture. I really appreciated this wisdom, Tracy. Mm. Uh, it reveals that we have a shared humanity and, mm. and one good that seems to have come out of all of the pain and, 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 and struggle that we're still in is that we realize that we really do want to connect with people. We want to connect with each other, either at work or in, in our personal lives more intimately and we crave that connection. <laughs> yes, yes, we do. I, I, I think this book is what's, this book came out during the pandemic because of the pandemic, but I think it's a book that could be used throughout our entire lives, no matter what's going mm. on. Here's my question. Why does good communication foster and ultimately need to be our foundation for connection, no matter what mode of connection we are engaged in? Oh, what a great question. Thank you for asking that. Good communication is our personal currency. It attracts us to each other. 
It impacts our ability to be heard. It leads us to greater awareness and empathy of other people. And we need more empathy than ever. And it ignites curiosity and good conversation. How do you feel after a great conversation? Energized, excited, enthusiastic. There's nothing better than a good conversation. I find myself right now using my hands in excitement because we've had such a great exchange. And that's that's our personal currency, that good communication. And in, in my experience, once you begin to embrace these skills, practice these skills, lose those words to lose, gain those words to use, practice the skills around networking, Using someone's name, that's another important skill that makes people feel important. When you begin to use these skills, then people will begin to, you'll begin to see yourself and other people will begin to see you as smart and competent and friendly and capable and unique and confident. And then that is that virtuous cycle that we talked about at the beginning. When you feel better because of the skills you practiced, then other people feel better about you. It's exciting. It is exciting. I, I sincerely appreciate these skills. And, and, and there are things that we just have to keep reminding ourselves about them. I think this, that's why I'm going to appreciate this book even more because it's a resource to return to. Mm. Um, and as you said, don't, don't force ourselves to feel we have to learn all these all at once. Just one a month, practice it, go through it. That's right. And I have found a lot of the readers have said they pick a chapter. They don't even start at the beginning. I mean, I'd love people to start at the beginning, but it doesn't matter. You can pick a chapter and and read it. So one chapter is five pages. And then you can move on to another chapter when you need it. One of the areas I talked about is using someone's name. Scientists tell us when you use someone's name, it activates a part of their brain that gets their attention. That's a very small skill you can use. It could be with a colleague. It could be with a friend or somebody in your family. Makes them feel as if they are the most important person in the room. And they are. Yeah, that is so true. It's such a simple thing. Such a Mm -hmm. simple thing. All right. I cannot wrap up our conversation without without our traditional concluding question. We're going to take it to the simple pleasures. So uh, what is a simple luxury or pleasure that you enjoy in your everyday that elevates it just perfectly. Well, I really had to think about this answer because I am a doer and a doer goes, 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 goes. And that's not always healthy. I really had to think about what I do for a simple pleasure. And this is what it is. And it's a new one for me. We've been in our house now for two years and we have a front flower bed that stretches the length of the house. And in the winter that we have mums, and in the spring we have tulips and daffodils, and in the summer we have zinnias. And I have made myself, forced myself most days to go sit on the ledge of that flower bed and enjoy the flowers, the colors, the bees that come, the birds that fly by, a little bit of a wind, gentle breeze. And that's hard for me, Shannon because I want to get one more thing done. I want to answer one more email. And that's not healthy. And I'm so grateful that you forced me to think of what am I doing every day besides making my bed. We always make our bed that makes me feel great. I got something accomplished. And then sitting by the flower bed. Thank you for that challenge, because it's made me consider doing it even more regularly than I do. So, I, and this is the follow up question to that. What does that do for you? Have you noticed that it is? I mean, I'm curious what what your bodily response, your mental response is now that you're doing that. It is, it is slowing me down, and in my head, I know there will always be time to do everything I need and have to do. But there's no substitute for calming down, and. I don't know how you and your listeners have experienced the pandemic, but I worked harder than ever. I had to completely rearrange my business. I used to do all in-person work, and now it's all virtual. And I have been exhausted. One day I said to my husband, I said to him, I'm, I'm so glad 
oh my gosh, I'm so glad it's Thursday. And he looked at me and said, Tracy, it's Tuesday. (laughs) I said, he said, yeah, today's Tuesday. And I thought, all our days are mixed up. So the idea of sitting down by the flower bed and simply looking at the colors is refreshing and soothing to my soul. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I have a feeling you've helped a lot of people to consider maybe finding something like that in their own every days. Listeners, Tracy Hooper's book, The New Hello, What to Say, What to Do in the New World of Work is available now in paperback and audio wherever you shop for books. I will provide direct links to it as well as Tracy's website, The Confidence Project. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Tracy, for sharing all that you have. My pleasure. (laughs) For all that Tracy and I have talked about, to learn more about Tracy's website, theconfidenceproject.com, to find out more about her book, Visit the show notes for today's episode, the simply luxurious life.com slash podcast 312 or tsll.co slash podcast 312. Back in episode five, when Tracy first came on the show, I enjoyed having her speak specifically about the benefits of confidence. That particular episode was titled Confidence How to Gain It and Why It's Invaluable. I encourage you to check out that episode. It is a foundational piece that explains what her company is about. And of course, check out her website as well. But what I am so tickled with is that she does have a book now that you can hold in your hand, you can have it as a resource, and she introduces you to so many doable, simple shifts in how we engage with the world, how we communicate, which is a vital part of a civil society that would like to grow and connect. And isn't that what we all are craving in in one way or another? We're all wanting it in different amounts or having missed some of what was taken away in different amounts. But as we spoke about in our conversation, that is what was lacking for so long. What now? 17, 18 months? And we're still not entirely shifted back into a better new groove. So I want to thank you for tuning in today. We have a new episode coming the first Monday of October, Monday, October 4th. And I do hope you'll join me then. Have a wonderful week. Bonjour. Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. For more ideas and inspiration throughout the week, visit the blog, The Simply Luxurious Life, with the shortened URL, tsll.co. For more in-depth exploration of how to cultivate your own unique, simply luxurious life, be sure to pick up my first two books. Each are available in hardback, paperback, ebook, and at Audible for audio listening. The first is titled Choosing the Simply Luxurious Life and the second Living the Simply Luxurious Life. And look for a third book to be released in the spring of 2022. Readers can now join the more intimate Simply Luxurious Life international community by becoming members of the blog, which provides ad-free unlimited reading and access to exclusive content such as each month's A Cup of Moments video chat, tours of my home, Le Papillon, the regular monthly post, What Made Me Smile, and Saturday Ponderings, as well as the opportunity to enter all of the giveaways during French and British weeks. To stay caught up on all things Simply Luxurious, the podcast, blog post, and the cooking show, as well as receive exclusive news and an extra dose of inspiration to jumpstart your new month, subscribe to the Simply Luxurious Life's free monthly newsletter, which arrives on the last day of each month. And there's a weekly newsletter, a favorite of listeners and readers, which is also free and arrives each Friday to keep you caught up on the recent weekly posts on the blog. Enjoy with a hot cup of tea or a cup of morning coffee and stay in the know about all things Simply Luxurious. Thank you for tuning in today and look for two new episodes of this podcast each month on the first and third Monday. 
to be alerted to new episodes and when they become available, follow on Instagram, the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, and only the news about this show will be shared. Until next time, I'm your host, Shannon Abels. Bonjour.